is possibly by far the youngest chief economic advisor. In fact, I am a little intimidated because uh, I, uh, you know, intimidated because of two things. One, the title, you know, he's the chief economic advisor of government of India. Secondly, I wasn't too sure if I was going to get uh, his complete name uh, in full, you know, with the correct pronunciation and all that. So I asked him, what do I call you? He said, call me Subhu, I'm fine. I don't know if protocol is going to come in the way and if I'm going to get a letter from Prime Minister Modi tomorrow morning. But I think I'll, I'll stick to Subhu. So, Subhu, welcome. Uh, we'll start with a song, I think. Uh, is that what you mean? We'll start with a song because I was, I was just informed that you're a singer. And uh, I also have realized, I think, uh, your return from the United States, you know, where you had a wager of a thousand dollars with a friend of yours. I'm pretty confident after just, uh, you know, meeting your wife now, I'm pretty confident it was because of the wife and not because of that thousand dollar bet you had. It was because of the wife he returned back home. So welcome. You know it very well. <laughs> yes, I do. We are both married men. Uh, <laughs> let, let's start off, you know, with uh, uh, a quick keynote by Professor Krishnamurti Subramanian and then we will get into the uh, Q&A after a bit. So, please uh, take the podium and uh, give us your insights. Thank you. Everyone, and uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me. Uh, it's really very pleasing to be back in Hyderabad as uh, the Honorable Minister was sharing and Secretary Jayesh Ranjan was saying, you know, I've spent now close to a decade here and I've loved the city, loved every part of uh, being in, in Hyderabad, being at ISB. So it's really a homecoming for me and really enjoy, uh, <clears throat> you know, being here to sort of share my thoughts. Very briefly, I just want to set the stage for um, the, <clears throat> uh, w the way healthcare is. Uh, I'll talk less about what, how healthcare is, but try and paint a vision for how healthcare I view healthcare would be uh, going forward maybe 15, 20 years. Um, if, we, if we think about in many areas, India has leapfrogged the uh, developed nations and uh, hopefully the vision that I articulate can actually be, be the starter for this leapfrogging that can happen in uh, healthcare as well. Um, so if you can have the, does anybody have the? Okay, yeah. Only if you look at, uh, some of the key problems or concerns that, uh, that, that we face right now. If you look at the, the healthcare system uh, in, the, in, the, in the Indian economy, uh, you have poor financial protection, uh, high out-of-pocket expenditures, um, and by out-of-pocket expenditures, these are expenditures that individuals um, you know, invest on their own healthcare. That's, that's one key problem that, that, we, that we face in the, in the country. Uh, there's clearly a need for improvement and outcomes in terms of measures of, of quality for, of, of healthcare. Um, if you look at the hospitalization rates and the outpatient rates as well, when we compare with some of the other economies, the, these rates tend to be very low uh, and that's something that, that we need to, to work on. Um, and then as, as I sort of alluded to, there's suboptimal access, access to healthcare, quality healthcare, especially at the bottom of the pyramid tends to be low and the quality of that care is also low. And I just want to sort of outline, you know, and, and this will be very useful when we discuss going forward as well. If you think about the role of government, and this is something that I've actually been um, quite conscious about, especially in, you know, in our country, if you think, take any public good, you know, whether it's actually healthcare, healthcare is an important public good, but take any other public good, education or, you know, security or it's, you know, any of those uh, other public goods, People like us who are better off can, can you know, get that public good in the private market. If, for instance, the government is not able to provide, let's say, good health care, we can go to private hospitals. But people at the bottom of the pyramid cannot do so. And that is something that is very important for us to recognize. Moreover, in, in India and in a lot of other countries as well, Typically a shock that someone at the, you know, a, a poor person, let's say, faces, a temporary shock can be something that creates permanent, uh, you know, a debilitation for, for such families. Therefore, the health care becomes extremely important, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for the government to provide. Uh, just quickly, uh, sort of examining um, in, on a sort of a cross-country comparison, this is a ranking of some countries. Um, notice we are actually close to... Um, 
close to Ghana in terms of the ranking. So we rank 143rd in terms of the Committee of Nations. Uh, if we look across some of the neighboring nations, they're doing far better than us um, in terms of Sri Lanka 79th, Indonesia 91st, 91st, China 92nd, Thailand is about is, is also better than us. Uh, what is important, I want you to sort of keep this in mind when I show you some of the other statistics. Look at India's rank and then look at how the, um, you know, our spending and some of our other uh, investments is. You know, it's not that we are doing so poorly because we are spending extremely less on healthcare. As a percentage of GDP, if you look at these numbers here, you know, we are in the same ballpark compared to all the other countries that I showed you. In fact, we are better than Sri Lanka, Indonesia, you know, and Thailand in terms of the spending that we do on, on healthcare. Yet, despite this, this spending, we are not doing very well in terms of outcomes and that's something which we need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, if we look at the out-of-pocket expenditure, this is something which is really important as policy makers that we need to be concerned about, that the, the, the out-of-pocket expenditure for individuals in India is way higher than that of the other, other, other countries. And that sort of is a telling sign on the, on, on the healthcare sector as it, as it stands today. Uh, one other aspect, and I just want to sort of leave that for, for thought, which is if you look at the, uh, the, the, the rankings and also correlate it with the level of government control, what you will notice is that the level of government control is low in India and, and that seems to have some correlation with the way we are, we are performing compared to the, the many of the other countries where the level of uh, government control of healthcare is much higher. And this is important because unlike some of the other sectors and you know, I, I come from the University of Chicago which is said to be a, a sort of a, a, a preacher of markets and the, and the utility of markets, but what we have to recognize is that there are some reasons why healthcare may not be an industry where markets, unregulated markets can necessarily be allowed to, to function. And, and that's because if you think about it, when you go to a doctor, you, do, you don't know as much about healthcare as the doctor knows. And this is something that the academics use this jargon called information asymmetry. The fact that the provider of that of healthcare knows a lot more than you do and therefore you have to sort of place that trust in the, in the, in the doctor. But sometimes, you know, when the, con when the provider is also the supplier, you can have conflicts of interest and that becomes a concern that, that we have to keep in mind. A second aspect is that when you are sick, you know, and that happens to all of us, we want to be, you know, well tomorrow, day after. We actually are, you know, really keen to get well as soon as possible and that creates what we call in, in economics hyperbolic preferences, which is that we do not have the patience to wait for, and I think that's understandable, but this is a difference compared to other markets. You know, if, 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 other, if you think about other goods, sometimes we are willing to wait for, let's say, the right price or, you know, the right quality. But in healthcare, that is something that is not affordable at all. And that is an important aspect of healthcare that we should keep in mind. Finally, you know, we, none of us knows when we are going to get, get, become sick when we may have to go and approach a hospital, when we may have to invest sort of expenditures. So there is significant variability and uncertainty and you have to keep this in mind both from the supply side which is the hospitals or the providers of healthcare and from the demanders, in this case the customers. Nobody knows actually this. there is uncertainty and variability. So these three characteristics make healthcare an important area for government to think very carefully about the design of healthcare sector in the, in the economy and that is something and so I, I want to leave this thought that you know just unregulated markets might lead to suboptimal outcomes and therefore there is a role for government to play, to think very carefully about the design of, of healthcare in the economy. Uh, so let me just with that uh, just portray the way I see you know healthcare to be maybe, maybe uh, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Broadly if you think about right now if you think about healthcare, healthcare is primarily curative. The, when you get sick, you end up going to a hospital. But healthcare need not be that way. It can be more preventive. 
there can be an emphasis on well-being and health there might be uh, you know a use of, of various aspects of um, you know economics especially what is called behavioral economics recently richard taylor got the nobel prize for what is called nudge nudging people to actually do what is right for them and healthcare is especially an area where that behavioral economics of nudge can be very useful because many times we ourselves don't do you know what is right for us and actually in the indian context i think which is we must recognize the the value that alternative medicine provides um, I, i i wish to relate this anecdote about in hyderabad my younger brother you know who studied with me uh, in, in at iit kanpur was severe asthmatic and on the recommendation of a few friends he ended up coming here in hyderabad for the fish medicine took that medicine for 3 years and followed all the 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 uh, you know restrictions that were that were asked for by by the doctors to to actually uh, follow and lo and behold he actually has not been uh, you know as asthmatic at all he's really gotten cured and and that is that this incident that i'm relating is about 20 years back but you know that one incident actually made me start believing in the role that you know that alternative medicine especially ayurveda and and homeopathy etc can etc can play because the important difference and you know as economists we talk about what is called general equilibrium versus partial equilibrium which is do you treat the human body as just a part versus a system and one important aspect of ayurveda and alternative medicine is that you know it treats the human body as a system and understanding that if you try and change something at one place there there will be effects at other places and treating the mental aspect of health also as a critical element to 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 health and that is an important aspect so i can foresee 15 20 years later that the diagnosis of you know of of uh, ailments which is an important aspect is a very subtle science uh, in in ayurveda that's where technology can come in a lot more being able to understand the mental aspects and and integrate that into into medicine because particularly with some of these uh, you know uh, alternative medicines it's a diagnosis that is a critical and that's where technology can possibly play an an important role uh, if I, i i think you know uh, secretary jay shankar was talking about my fascination for technology i'm trained as an engineer but healthcare is one area where certainly there can be a huge role for technology just imagine if suppose there is a public health registry which is that all the you know uh, when i go to a doctor there is a centralized database from which he pulls out all the ailments that i have suffered from right from from my birth and not only that he is also using maybe private sector providers are using the data that government puts out with all the necessary checks for secrecy uh, and, and 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 data integrity but provides it to healthcare providers and for them to do analytics which says the analytics then said tells him as soon as he looks at my file it says oh sugu maybe you are actually at the onset of you know of of uh, early diabetes god forbid not but um, so so they maybe that prescription comes and that predictive ability that analytics can provide can then lead to prescription saying okay you need to be watching the sugar intake that you're doing so this is something that i think and i don't think we need to even wait 15 years but this is a real possibility and that's where technology can play a huge huge role in being able to and government especially can can play a role uh, in this uh um, you know final final aspect and this is again where uh you know the the the, the industry i think can play a critical role especially in in sort of basic research um this word surgical strikes is in vogue and i thought why not a surgical strike on on you know precise uh, uh interventions on cell on, on cancer cells um nanotechnology and and genome uh you know uh, uh programming can help being able to actually get at the cells that are actually mutant rather than having to actually do a carpet bomb of all the healthy cells around it as well so 10 15 years later this may be also something that we may be looking at and therefore cancer may not be the kind of you know fearful word that that it is uh, today so that's with that sort of broad thoughts about the vision that i foresee for 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 healthcare uh, you know over the next 15 20 years uh, i would love to actually uh, hear the thoughts of uh, of the honorable minister and interact with him thank you uh, the fact that the chief economic advisor is called me a minister i don't know if he's got some news that i don't have <laughs> thank you sir thank you that was comprehensive i think you covered all bases i am pretty much uh, left uh, with not many questions but nevertheless 
I'll do my bit, I'll ask you a few questions as well. You mentioned something very interesting. You talked about how sometimes lack of regulation or uh, lack of or minimal regulation sometimes leads to suboptimal outcomes. That was the line you used, that was a phrase you used. But in my opinion, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, pitch in for the industry here. I've heard on this very forum, on this very dais from the industry, I met with uh, a lot of uh, med tech companies from the United States and Europe. I met with a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies also from India and abroad. All of them have one bone to pick with you. When I say with you, I mean Government of India. So the question that they have is, too much regulation in a country like India sometimes. Careful in terms of thinking about the right kind of intervention. Um, as, as I was outlining that healthcare, because of some of the difficulties and how why the sector is different, may not be a sector where you could actually have laser fish. Um, but that is not to say that every intervention is necessarily good. There are some kinds of interventions that may be better than, than others. Um, what we also must do, I think especially is, and, and I think we, as a country we need to be moving towards this, which is whenever we think about any intervention, we should be focusing especially on some of the unintended consequences, thinking about that very carefully, doing a, a, a careful cost benefit analysis of that, and then, you know, uh, sort of go forward with the regulation. Just to give you a, an, you know, sort of, without getting into specifics, the broad idea that I'm thinking about, you, you know, this sector is something which is very technical, right? Um, the, if, if you are thinking about, let's say, you know, some quantity restrictions or price restrictions, let's say, those can be one way of, you know, but there will certainly be effects of that in access to some people versus others. Um, for instance, those people for whom, let's say, if I have to travel 20 kilometers, let's say, to, you know, to be able to avail healthcare, even if the price is set, let's say, all over India, you know, a particular price is set, the fact that I have to travel 20 kilometers or maybe 50 kilometers means that the cost that I am paying to be able to access that healthcare is very different from someone who is actually in the city. Let's say, for instance, we stay very close to continental hospitals, right? For us, it's a, it's a two-minute drive to be able to go there. But, but take someone who is, let's say, in Baran, you know, if he or she wants to come to access continental hospital, the cost is different. Now, this is where, you know, a one size fit up fit all sometimes as regulation does not work very well. And, and calibrated thinking about the kind of costs that is involved is important. Let me be very clear, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, I'm, I'm, I'm making two points here. One, that this is a sector that need, that cannot be let to be just laissez faire because of some of the, 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 the uh, frictions that I spoke about. But second point I'm saying is that is not a license for any kind of regulation. We have to be careful in what kind of interventions that we exactly. All right. I just to, again, just to extrapolate a bit on that same point. See, the industry, when it comes to drug discovery, when it comes to coming out with new uh, uh, drugs, spends billions of dollars, sure, billions and billions of dollars, and more often than not, they are not sure of the outcomes also, you know, when, when you end up spending billions of dollars and when you're not sure about the outcome. And then when there is price control on drugs, when there is price control on medical devices and uh, medical technologies, that tends to scare them a bit, you know, especially when somebody is looking to manufacture in India, especially when somebody is looking to enter India, especially when somebody is wanting to do more in India. Dr. Reddy's, you know, Chairman Satish Reddy is sitting right here. Let me acknowledge his presence as well. And let me also uh, add in what he was telling me the last time we met. Indian life sciences industry has been going through a bit of a, a bit of a rough ride over the last, especially last, you know, less than a decade. The growth has dipped. You know, they have uh, now dropped down to single digit numbers. And if they have to invest, not just Dr. Reddy's, but any pharma company, any biotech company today, if they have to invest billions of dollars into, into new drug discovery or new molecule discovery, they are worried about the fact that price control on drugs might come in the way of what, you know them investing uh, big time. So this fine balance that you talked about, this calibration that you talked about, you know, it's, it, when we hear, when I visit ministers in government of India, when I meet the officials in government of India, they're all gung ho about making India. But they don't really seem to understand the practical concerns of the industry when it comes to execution on the ground. Now, 
as somebody who's now newly inducted into advising the government, would you then make an effort to actually be also, a, you know, a, a positive advocate for the change that industry has been wanting from Hyderabad especially? Sure. So I, I think you know what you've highlighted is an extremely important point. Um, some of my early research happened to be in innovation um, and, and entrepreneurship, and therefore I certainly recognize the fact that there is huge uncertainty. That and that is why, for instance. If you think about it, and the, you know, academically we talk about how perfect competition does not lead to, in, to optimal level of innovation. Why? Because if you expect that, so for instance, we think about in a perfectly competitive market, um, any provider would only get sort of the price is equal to marginal cost. That's not enough incentive for the company to be able to in, invest a huge dollars uh, in, in their, you know, and because that investment is actually risky, the likelihood of getting you know, so discovering a new molecule, going through the clinical trials, that's huge uncertainty. Which is why, you know, generally if you think about the industry structure itself, monopoly does not work very well because it breeds complacency. But oligopoly oftentimes, and it sort of the research shows, leads to the best, most amount of innovation. So that there is the, any industry that actually, where they invest the money to be able to do the R&D, there is enough returns for them to be able to and that is something which is extremely important to, to keep in mind. But let me also give the other angle, mm -hmm. which is again because I've sort of uh, worked on this and I've looked at some of the data very carefully without again going into specifics. When, I, when I've looked at um, some of the, the, the and, and here I'm not talking necessarily about India, but, but other countries as well. Even when you look at, at, at prices of prices of drugs, where which are outside, outside the patent, you know, they basically have run through the patent period. In, in many instances, I've looked at that data, the, the prices can be about 12, 15 times the point of first sale, price of five, point of first sale, which then sort of, you know, makes you ask the question as well, that is this something which is actually, if, if the market were functioning, you know, perfectly, will you get that outcome, is the question that you ask, because definitely the reason patent regimes are provided, patenting actually, IPR regimes are there is precisely to incentivize the supplier to innovate. And, but once that 17, 20 year period of patents is run through, that's when generics are allowed so that you actually have competition and access to that drug comes in. But if suppose you do not have, let's say, adequate competition, then you may get this outcome where the prices are 15, 16 times. We're talking about margins that actually are, you know, are, are very large. So that's where, as a social planner, you start asking the, the other side of the question as well. And that's the balance that I'm talking about. That both sides actually, you know, policy making is about trying to actually juggle many different uh, stakeholders inside interests of many different stakeholders. And in healthcare, access is something that is very important as well. I'm not talking about, you know, changing anything during the pandemic that incentive for innovation has to be there. But beyond that, when you actually have drugs that actually un that need to be accessed by a large section, I'm just posing the question, we may have to think about other stakeholders as well. Anastasia, since you talked about healthcare access and quality, you know, healthcare, healthcare access and quality, uh, you know, there is a global index, HAQ, which rates countries, you know, across these two uh, factors and gives out ratings. 1990, about you know almost three decades ago now, India was ranked 153. 2018, India is ranked 143. So we just moved up 10 places. Assume for a minute, hypothetically speaking, you're not the chief economic advisor of India, but the prime minister of India, for a minute. I believe the place is also going to be vacant soon, just in case. Um, elections around the corner, don't read too much into it. All I'm saying is, if you are the Prime Minister of India, and if you had to do three things, to make India jump not from 153 to 143 over a period of 30 years, because we all in this room would love to believe and like to believe that India has really made rapid strides of progress. We've done very well on many, many fronts. But healthcare, affordability, accessibility, availability of drugs, quality of medicine, quality of human life, you know, living standards of the people in India. If you look at the numbers globally, it appears that we have not done that well, you know, to pat ourselves in the back. So, what are the top three or five things sure. that you would like to do, you know? So, uh, let, me, let me 
sort of stick to my role and, and you know. So you're not going to be the prime minister even hypothetically. <laughs> All right, Kavita. I'm, I'm going to do a you know intricate language well left on that question. All right. <laughs> uh, so uh, the first thing I would actually talk about is as, as I uh, so if we uh, as, as I was outlining that the structure. In, in healthcare markets, oftentimes is a mix of oligopoly and oligopsony, which is, you know, um, many buyers, not too many, okay? and similarly many sellers. Okay? Um, and, and that's what, again, when we look at internationally, is a, is a structure that seems to work very well. So, whether at the state level or at the, you know, at the central government level, the government, you know, is actually a buyer of services, whether it's actually through CGHS, for railways, health, you know, defense sector, is, is buying in many different, um, but possibly in fragmented, you know, more fragmented ways than you would like. Now, one way of sort of getting at that optimal structure that I've talked about is to combine that and maybe actually bring bargaining power. And, and thereby, when, you know, as the government, you actually have the power to possibly be able to ensure quality as well, as, as a bigger buyer, right, that's something that I would think about, number one. Uh, number two that I would think about is actually, and here's where I, I look at the reform that, that you know, the, the template for reform that GST has provided as something which is very, which, which we need to understand and possibly be able to replicate. Uh, because here you had an instance where centre and the states came together to be able to, to decide on something that was best for the country as a whole when there were some, you know, some, some, Possible states are actually which were you know um, which, which may have uh, in the short run to sort of lose and others that were winning and that's where the bargaining happened and you know we were able to get it. So I, I would take that template and think about more federalism and and, and greater cooperation between. Can I, can I we finish that second? point and then I go to um, yeah. on 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 center and, and, and states. Um, so and, and again we have the, the sort of to outline the vision here. Some of the spending that that can be provided here could be based on if you you know take the example of how venture capitalists fund startups in, health, in the health sector. Let's say, right? They do a staged kind of financing based on outcomes, and and that may be something, and that seems to have worked very well. Some thoughts about though that can be brought in, saying you know as as a center, and you know sort of when we implement recommendations of the finance commission as well. Can we make it more contingent on outcomes um, and thereby incentivize sort of this race to the top among states? Um, and, and that's the sort of vision that I'm trying to articulate in, the, in terms of the second aspect. Um, a third, which I already spoke about, which is the data. And I think, again, you know, governments uh, are, are huge, are sitting on huge sets of data possibly. Not only, you know, are, are they sitting on data, but there's a possibility of tri triangulating. You have government data, data from possibly private health providers and administrative data. And you combine all the all three to be able to create that foundation, that data infrastructure. Because again, when we think conceptually, government's role is to provide public goods. And in today's age, data and the insight that you obtain from data has become a public good. So the role that government should be providing is with all the necessary checks and balances to ensure privacy, etc., create that infrastructure mm -hmm. and create that backbone on which private sector can sit and, and then you know leap from there, you know, doing a lot of analytics and you know ensure better service delivery. You know, all I think the, the sort of the possibilities are, are infinite there once the data starts coming in and being able to sort of combine different aspects of both qualitative and quantitative basis. For instance, you know, my blood pressure or let's say my sugar, you know, level is a quantitative measure. But but the way, let's say, I, I react to, you know, stress or maybe the way I actually, um, you know, uh, I, 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 how disciplined I am, let's say, is a qualitative aspect. The combination of that, those things actually can really provide you a much better holistic perspective on health. So these are sort of three broad things that I would talk about, um, you know, ways in which to uh, take this sort of initiative forward. I think I agree with you on point one and point three. I have a bone to pick with you on point two. You tangentially touched upon, you know, this aspect of cooperative federalism and how the federal government and the state governments need to work together on alleviating, you know, the healthcare access, you know, quality, etc., etc. 
Now the one question I have for you is, this is something that as an Indian, I, I'm not, I, please don't think of me as a policy maker belonging to a specific party here in uh, Telangana, but just as an Indian, as a, as a citizen. What bothers me is, why is everything so centralized in India? I mean, when it comes to healthcare, since we are talking healthcare, why should somebody sitting in Delhi decide what is the kind of devolution of money on the health front that should be given to a primary health care center in a tribal village in Warangal district? Or why should somebody sitting in Delhi decide what is the quantum of money that needs to be given to the area hospital in Sirisilla, my constituency? Why can't some subjects such as health, education be taken off the concurrent list, be given completely to the states and let them, you know, give them the quantum of money that you had planned. For instance, just to give you, uh, you know, just to uh, uh, give you an inkling of what, uh, what, what, what is really behind the point I'm trying to make. See, in Telangana and in Andhra Pradesh, in the erstwhile United States of Andhra Pradesh, the government, the then government, Congress government, had launched a program, a universal health care program called Arogish. This was about 10 years ago, about 2008. And it's been going on beautifully well. We spend about 900 plus crores every year. We cover nearly 1,000 ailments and we provide comprehensive health insurance to the tune of 2 lakh rupees for about 100 crore, not 100 crore, but 1 crore families in Telangana. Now, off late a scheme, Ayushman Bharat comes in. Now, Government of India tries to tell us that that is better than Arogishri. Therefore, you got to play along, you got to adopt. My question to you is, aren't there areas where we can take, you know, our job more seriously. Can government of India not just concentrate, I know I'm dragging you into politics a bit. Can government of India not take care of defense, external affairs, foreign policy, trade, commerce, there's enough to do. Why can't they leave healthcare and education to, to you know, to, why can't they push it into the state's domain, give a kitty of money and say, you know, dovetail it to the existing program, or come out with something novel, depending on your state's, uh, you know, equation and situation. Do you not agree with it philosophically or uh, do you still see that, you know, that Team India thing that Prime Minister Modi talks about is still relevant in today's context? So, that, I think... I know you're new to the job, by the way. <laughs> uh, that, that's an excellent question and which makes me actually, as, a, as someone who actually thinks, likes thinking about these aspects, uh, I would want to be even more ambitious in my thinking. And then say, why should why should states decide? You know how districts should be spending their, their money. Absolutely, local governments, <laughs> municipalities, zilla parishads, mandal parishads. Why not? More than many, why not? Uh, so we should definitely be you know proceeding first. He's become a politician already, by the way. So we we should be proceeding further along the lines of federalism. I think I'm already seeing signs of that. Um, you know, I, I am an optimist, uh, and but but this is not just based on optimism. Actually, looking at you know, on if you look at, for instance, the you know the, the implementations of the 14th Finance Commission, right? Uh, the devolution devolution of funds to states has actually increased from 32 percent to 40 percent. Uh, I I think there is, uh, if we look at some of the you know. The rankings, for instance, Telangana is doing so well on, on ease of doing business. Right um, now, th it, these are examples of states trying to compete, you know, to sort of towards the top, right? a race to the top, not necessarily a race to the bottom. There are signs of actually of, of you know healthy competition among states, which is being furthered, and I refer to GST already, uh, which basically is a good step towards federalism. Um, I think you know I am taking on board the. The, the sort of the comment that you're making, uh, but I would outline the vision that we need to definitely move towards fe greater federalism, not only at the state level, but state to district level as well, uh, and and that's a, a, a task that actually all governments, I think, should definitely be thinking very carefully about. Understood. And um, one thing I'd also touch upon from what you just uh, mentioned, you, know, you talked about how in India we are focused more on curative, not really on preventive. Now. Just to give you an insight of what the government of Telangana has been doing, we've in fact started a, a brilliant program called uh, Kanti Velugu, which is screening of the eyes. It's eye care for all. Yeah. You know, uh, we've we've started screening of um, you know the eyes of every single citizen. We've already covered nearly 1.7 crore people on our way to completely comprehensively cover every single citizen in the state of Telangana. 
Then we are following it up with a complete uh, uh, ENT checkup. Then it would be followed again by the dental checkup, which would again be followed by complete, uh, you know, pathological tests, you know, blood groups and you know all all kinds of blood tests and everything else that needs to be done. And then our chief minister's dream is to build health profile of each citizen, thereby building the health profile of the state, and eventually digitizing everything, creating electronic health records of each and every single citizen of the state, thereby possibly becoming the first state in India to leverage technology so well, and also ensuring that we save a few lives in case there is an accident or there is a, a disaster somewhere. If uh, people are rushed into uh, an ER, you know, it would definitely save a few lives if you're just able to bring up somebody's blood group, somebody's name, somebody's precondition, allergies, etc., by way of a fingerprint or iris, and that should save lots of lives. So just to give you, an, just to give you a glimpse of why healthcare should be in the state's domain, because we have a larger control over state's machinery. I would strongly urge and strongly believe, since you are now advising government of India, my appeal to you is, since you focused also on curative versus preventive and how preventive also should be put up right there as a priority, my advice, best practices of different states. I'm sure there are many states in India which are doing other things which are equally good, which are equally good and which are equally, uh, uh, you know, worth emulation. So therefore, my request to you, Unfortunately, we don't come together as often as a country, as often as states, to share best practices, to learn from each other. We are all operating in silos. My appeal, my request to you is, firstly, bring us together more often, advise government of India to bring us more often together, share best practices, and also talk about how digitizing, leveraging technology, how it is going to help India as a country and Indians uh, uh, at large. No, I, I think that's an excellent suggestion and already, uh, for instance, Secretary Jay Shenzhen was talking about how yesterday I spent a you know, good amount of time uh, with, with all the senior officers, understanding some of the good work that is happening. Um, I, I, I think as, as a country, we should be trying to uh, learn from our successes, irrespective of where that success happens. There is, because there's a lot of work to be done. And, and therefore, we cannot be cherry picking where to pick you know, the, the, the winners. Wherever there are winners, we should be picking and implementing. And that's part of that effort that my office is trying to actually do, which is to understand things that, that, that are working well, not only you know, Telangana but other states as well. Um, you know, that, that's an initiative that I would definitely hope you can follow. Thank you. So, one last question, unless uh, we have any questions from the audience, one last question I have. And uh, that's a very, straight, very straightforward question. You talk about uh, uh, you know how technology can be leveraged in bringing about affordable healthcare to India. Now we are sitting in one of the most uh, interesting uh, technology capitals in India, Hyderabad. We've lived here for 10 years. You know the city very well, and you know how you know the city's capabilities. We have a beautiful uh, you know ecosystem when it comes to life sciences. One third of world vaccines are produced here. One third of India's pharmaceuticals are produced here. Information technology. We are number two only to Bangalore. We, we are doing tremendous work on innovation, not too far away from the ISB campus. You know the story. So my question to you is now, I even had a meeting uh, and I, I've even been to their facility. Uh, Novartis has a large office here. They're talking about digital drug discovery. They're talking about digital drug design. They're talking about how the interface, the interjunction of uh, information technology and biology, life sciences, can actually herald, usher in affordable healthcare to the world at large. Since you're sitting in Hyderabad, since we're having this chat in Hyderabad, you know, one of the leaders in life sciences and information technology, how can we, you know, enable, how can we, uh, you know, uh, get in more support from the private sector? How can we make it more attractive for, uh, uh, you know, how can we make more attractive policies for, from government of India's side, government of Telangana's side, to make sure that we get more and more global players coming and leverage this wonderful interface that we've developed between the digital convergence between information technology and uh, life sciences? So, again, that's, I think, an excellent question. Um, broadly, if we look at how innovation happens, um, innovation happens a lot through clusters. Mm -hmm. Hyderabad, as you've already talked about, is one such cluster. Now, as an academic, I would um, urge that and, and I think in India, we have not focused as much on basic research. Uh, I, I think we, and, you know, investment in basic research happens when, you know, when we are more visionary, 
without necessarily asking for results from that research, you know, five years later, say, or ten years later. If I, I often give this example because you know, just sort of on a sort of a, um, a more informal note, when I would finish my teaching at ISB, students would ask me, Prof, when can you, when, when can we see you next? And I would say maybe eight months later, and they'd say, why do, why don't we see you often? And then. I would tell them about how I actually spend the rest of my time doing research. And ISB is a place that has actually sort of really uh, created that ecosystem. Uh, we need more of that. We need more universities doing basic research. And I also would give them the example of, of Ramanujam. Right? At the time when Ramanujam was doing his work on, uh, you know, on number theory, there was no application of it, not even in the next 50 years. But today, if we look at you know a lot of the algorithms that we see actually apply that that number theory. I think that emphasis on just understanding the world, this basic research, without being saying, okay, we need some returns from this, you know, um, because a, a lot of the uh, innovation that you're talking about and the next generation of innovations will come only when we actually also invest in basic research, and and that's where I think our industry, I would. I would sort of um, humbly request our industry to, to have that vision that if they actually have to leapfrog and start becoming the, you know, the sort of the innovators and the ones that create the new molecules, those molecules that are, let's say, used world over, right, then they have to start working very closely with academia on, on and, and basic, fostering basic research. And here's where the industry government collaboration also, you know, is important. For instance, in the US, and you've been, you know, uh, in the m many years there, the small business program, for instance, right, where some of the money was, you know, brought in by government, but the wetting of the proposals was done by private sector because, you know, the, they understood very well that the expertise to wet those proposals sits in the private sector. I think some of those initiatives already, I, I can see, still some of those are being brought in, but more of those that needs to happen in general for our basic research. So I think so that's something that I would emphasize a lot on in general, industry and government investing in basic research across the board. And I'm talking about not only healthcare but other areas as well. If we really have to act, if the next, let's say, 30, 40, 50 years has to belong to India then you know, it cannot happen without large amount of investment in basic research and taking that forward. That is something which, and that also means actually wherever there is, for instance, you know, some of the philanthropic money has to go into research. Yes, we have, we, you know, there is immediate returns from building a toilet or let's say building, you know, other, other uh, you know, giving, giving food, but this is something that is long run, that is also something that we need to invest in in general. Uh, overall, I think, I, I, in my own research, I found that infrastructure, especially the soft infrastructure, is, is extremely important. And we do have, you know, uh, enough of skilled manpower. Um, being able to sort of train them so that they also develop this scientific, the tempo for research is, is also important because if research has to happen, we have to have enough of skilled people who, who enjoy research. Um, and that's the other sort of part of the ecosystem that I would. Um, you know, strongly urge for us to build. Um, I think, and, and uh, finally, as I've already talked about, governments need to be thinking very carefully about how to create incentives for research, for creating that ecosystem. Um, and, and without that ecosystem, without that clusters, I think some of the some of the vision that I've articulated will, I think, sort of may, may not be fully achieved. Fantastic. I loved exchanging some thoughts with you. I'd be remiss in my fiduciary responsibility, if I don't mention the fact that in fact uh, under your former dean and a former mentor Rajit Ramnekar's leadership, we've started Former and something. current mentor. I'm sorry? Former and current mentor. You know, mentors never become so what do you know, his economic excellency now Ajit? <laughs> okay, his economic excellency Ajit Ramnekar's leadership. I must mention to you that uh, we are in fact as government of Telangana, uh, along with the support of the industry here, we, are, we have started building on what is called as uh, research and innovation circle of Hyderabad just to precisely bring about that collaborative effort between industry, academia, and with a market outcome oriented, you know, outcome focused approach. So we are, you know, uh, doing something significant in that effort. And uh, once again, many, many thanks. And uh, if uh, there are any questions uh, for Subhu? Yes, are we winding up? All right, not even one question. 
We we thank you, uh, right. sir.